years for Africa to separate from Central America. 200 million years. Well, if the, if the water of the Atlantic Ocean was pure, no salt, and you just took the salt that's coming in through the Mediterranean, the Amazon, the St. Lawrence River, the Mississippi, the different rivers, and you calculate it and you add it up, how long would it take to get the amount of salt that's in there now? 62 million years, maximum. Now, there are springs of salt under the ocean, which would reduce that rate drastically, and they suggested they could bring it down to 4,500. But 62 million, it's a bat of an eye, evolutionary eye. It's nothing, <laughs> okay, it's, it's nothing. So, where's the salt? Well, let's talk about the Dead Sea, because we have another system with the Dead Sea, which we can measure directly. Dead Sea is very interesting, because it's about 1,100 to 1,200 feet below sea level. The water can't go out of it except one way, through evaporation. Now, when water evaporates, as you know, if you take your glass, if you take a glass in the evening, you just leave a little bit of water. When you come back in the morning, you have a little ring left, right? Those are the salts, because salts don't evaporate. Well, here you go. This is the ring around <laughs> the ring around the Dead Sea. <laughs> These salts are worth trillions of dollars, trillions. In fact, I believe so. there'll be some of the war, some of the wars around Israel will have to do with the value of what's here. There's already a lot of mining operations going on. And there are a lot of rare minerals involved in the Dead Sea. Well, all these salts have accumulated because the water has evaporated. Now, the evolutionary paradigm has said that the geological strata, the rock where the Dead Sea is, is supposed to be 5 million years old. It's supposed to be 5 million. Well, let's calculate how long it would take for the salt to accumulate in the Dead Sea. There's only one river really running into it. It's the River Jordan. The encyclopedia has done this for us. In volume 19... In the 19, version 1973, it says, the Dead Sea contains approximately 11.6 billion tons of salt. And the River Jordan adds each year 850,000 tons of salt. Now, the calculation is 11.6 billion divided by 850,000 comes up to 13,647 years. Okay. This is a long way from 5 million, isn't it? Now, if you also go in, in that same encyclopedia and look up salt springs, you'll find out there are salt springs in the Dead Sea. So you have more salt coming in, which reduces the age even more. Maybe down to about 6,000 years or less. Hmm. Something's going wrong with these millions of years, isn't it? We don't seem to be finding the evidence that should show up everywhere if the Earth is old. Notice I can give these talks without ever mentioning the Bible. I can't. They come to their own conclusion, though. <laughs> Because even though we're in a post-Christian society, you understand my ministry is generally to French people. I have 400 million, there are 400 million French people in the world. There are only seven books on creationism. They're all out of date. Uh, it's, it's a very serious situation. There are fewer Christians in Quebec per capita than in Japan. I'm in a mission field. When I do a debate, there will be, out of 400 people, there will be 390 non-Christians and 10 Christians. And the 10 Christians are there, the ones who organized it. Okay, it's a very few Christians where I am. I'm on a mission field. People don't recognize that, and it's unfortunate because we don't get the support we need as a mission field, because obviously we can't get all the support internally, uh, because they say, oh, it's part of North America, and we're sort of post-Christian. Well, no. <laughs> we're, we're, we're definitely post-Christian. <laughs> we're like, really post-Christian. <laughs> we're like, non-Christian. Well, let's take a look at a couple of other arguments. <clears throat> we're going to look at sedimentation rates. We're going to look at decreasing magnetic field, and we're going to look at the population growth. Remember, these are just some of them. There are actually more arguments, but I'm, I'm going to probably finish on these ones. Now, we talked about sediment. And if we take a look at the, the Grand Canyon, we have these layers of sediment. Now, I'm going to help you out with some areas of geology that even some geology students I have met don't understand. In fact, some of the stuff I'm going to tell you, I only learned last year. I'm a biologist. My master's in, in plant biology, in biotechnology. I'm a specialist on cloning plants. Uh, so geology isn't necessarily my specialty. But there are some misconceptions that we all have, and I believe it's on purpose. Some of it's on purpose, and I'll explain that. You'll, you'll be astounded by what you're going to find out. Some of these misconceptions are that the, the strata represent different ages, right? That you have one strata below, and the one above it has to be younger than the one below it because it got deposited horizontally, right? Well, is that true? That's what we're going to look at. I've got to point the right direction. I keep pointing to the camera. All right. Here we have a polystrata tree. Now, I want you to remember this picture because you're going to see the link in a, in a few slides down the road. This tree, now some people said, well, maybe the, the water bored a hole and then it filled up with sediment and got fossilized. 
Well, you could say, yes, that does happen, except this one happens to have bark along the side, uh, fossilized bark. So this is really a tree. And it's going through about 10,000 years worth of evolutionary sediment. So do you think the tree just stood there while it got fossilized from its roots up in water? Didn't rot. It kept growing, I guess. Just got fossilized over 10,000 years. Well, I don't think so. This looks sort of catastrophe, doesn't it? Looks pretty sudden. But how did all that strata get around it? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> all right. This is Mount St. Helens, Washington. This is before it blew up. These slides come from uh, the, have been, uh, I've been allowed to use them from Dr. Steve Austin, the one I mentioned before, Dr. Steve Austin, Russell Humphreys, that go around from the university, from uh, Institute of Creation Research in uh, San Diego. And there's actually a creationist group that gives tours of Mount St. Helens, and they have a whole series they sell too that are the same slides. I'm only going to show you a bit of it. Well, this is before it blew up. Now notice all the ice on top. It's going to become a factor, all that ice on top. Because, of course, the mountain starts heating up, right? <laughs> and ice becomes water or becomes steam. That's even worse. Now, a volcano, we're mostly, you know, if you look at the movies, what do they focus on in the volcano? Well, they focus on the lava, don't they? All the lava coming down, you see that molten lava. But <laughs> lava isn't what causes the greatest issues with volcanoes. It's the steam. Volcanoes have 95% steam when they shoot up. It goes really high, really strong, and uh, you'll see in a moment what it does. Now, this is Mount St. Helens after it blew up. It lost 1,300 feet. 1 1.5 cubic miles of soil were blown into the air. Went towards the north side. It's very interesting. These vol volcanoes generally break towards the north side. They don't usually break up like the picture we see. They usually break out the side uh, because part of the mountain will start giving away from the seismic effect. And usually it's towards the north. I believe, I may be wrong about this, but I believe it's partly because the north side will have the more snow on it. Okay, be the heaviest side, etc. And it's starting to turn to steam. Well. Let's take a look at what happened a little closer. Here you have in the bottom, you can see where it's, at, where it's Mount St. Helens. This is before it blew up. Now take a look. You have the road, the State Road 504. You have Spirit Lake, and we're going to talk quite a bit about Spirit Lake. And the number you see there, 3,198, that's the altitude. Okay, that's how high it is up. And that's going to change after the mountain blows up. <laughs> it's going to get higher. The lake's going to rise 250 feet. Um, and look at some of the rivers. You have Coldwater Creek up the side, and you have North Fork, Fork and Tuttle River. These are all creeks and rivers, right? OK, let's see what happens. Over an event that took two days. First, this happened. Everything you see that's gray.